So, Ilan, the U.S. recently vetoed a U.N. Security Council resolution calling all Israeli settlements illegal and an obstacle to peace, saying that it harmed ch chances of peace talks. Interestingly, all the other countries voted for, and the U.S. faced criticism from its European allies. The U.S. might seem more and more isolated when it comes to Israel. So what is Israel's strategic importance for the U.S. nowadays, and has it changed since 1967? I think that Israel's uh, importance to the United States is still the same as it has been. Uh, we have to wait and see whether the Arab uh, revolutions uh, would change it. But uh, at the time that that veto was given, uh, I think even if there was a fundamental impact of what happened in the uh, Arab world on Americans thinking on Israel, it's too early for it to be shown in American policy. So my guess is, and we've seen it throughout the Barack Obama administration policy towards Israel, that the same pressures that worked in uh, and, and formulated American policy towards Israel in the Bush administration are still at work in the Obama administration. So nobody should have been surprised by the fact that Obama vetoed uh, this, uh, this resolution. And if there would be another one, they would veto it again. Although I do think that um, the fact that the European members, member states did not veto, did not join the Americans on this, is a sign of the overall trend that we can see. You call it isolation I would, uh, of the United States. I would call it uh, the beginning of an internal process of rethinking American policy, uh, which uh, will take quite a while to mature, but is definitely happening. It was reported on Haaretz and The Guardian that Angela Merkel had a very tough telephone call with Netanyahu about the peace process, telling him you are the one who has disappointed us. You haven't made a single step to, to advance peace. Coming from Germany, Europe's number one supporter of Israel with Poland, this is quite extraordinary. Could we witness a change in Europe's stance towards Israel soon? And more importantly, could Europe play a more balanced role than the US in the Palestine question? We have to be careful here. It's true about Angela Merkel as much as it is true about Barack Obama. What they want instead of the Netanyahu government, which is definitely uh, a, a kind of government that they don't like to deal with, is a central Zionist government, the Kadima government, which I will remind you, according to the Al Jazeera leaks, refused even to accept the most generous and stupid ever offer that the Palestinian leadership has made to the Israelis under Olmert. So, when Angela Merkel is angry with Netanyahu, she wants to see Tsipi Livni as a prime minister, which will not constitute any change in Israeli policy or would in any way ease the oppression of the Palestinians. So that's one point. So this is not that much of good news, the fact that they're angry with Netanyahu. It, time will tell whether this may represent something more profound, which is the undemocratic situation in Europe by which you have a public opinion which is anti-Israeli and pro-Palestinian, but is not reflected in the policies of the political elites. It's possible that this also reflects a wish by politicians such as Merkel to represent more faithfully the basic uh, impulse and positions of the European public towards Israel. Um, but I think uh, we have to wait and see whether this moment of transformation is really taking place in front of our eyes. The recent Palestine papers have confirmed that Israel and the US were the two main rejectionists in the Israel-Palestine conflict. But instead of using the papers to expose Israeli rejectionism, the PA has attacked Al Jazeera, the messenger. How do you explain this, and how long do you think the PA will be able to play the collaborator role before a new type of intifada will erupt? I, it's very easy to understand why the PA uh, attacked Al Jazeera. It came in a very unpleasant moment uh, where all around the Arab world people were uh, asking for more democracy, transparency and fair representation. And what the Al Jazeera leaks revealed was that the PA was exactly the opposite of all these things. 
So I'm not surprised that they, they, they rather attack Al Jazeera than, than Israel. Um, as far as the longevity uh, of the PA is concerned, um, this really can only be uh, connected to more general transformations. I don't think there, there would be an internal Palestinian transformation without several things happening beforehand. One is the continuation, the success, successful continuation of the kind of transformation we have seen in the Arab world. I think uh, 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 even uh, a democratization process in action rather than democracies as a kind of, as kind of final outcome, but even a, a, a continued process of democratization in the Arab world is one thing which will encourage people to um, get rid of the PA. Secondly, the movement of the civil society uh, campaign against Israel into more uh, into the sphere of political elites and political power. Uh, and thirdly, and most importantly, you still need to find a solution for the question of Palestinian representation. Because it's very clear that the PA is not the PLO, but it's not very clear then who is the PLO. And only the Palestinians, in almost an impossible, fragmented reality, have to find a way of reawakening the process of representation. And if you have Palestinian representation, and you have a changing Arab world, and you have a political elite in the West that is willing to do something that its public wants it to do, I think the PA would disappear, and this was, would be a first station in the trip for a more fundamental transformation on the ground altogether. Some extraordinary events have taken place in the Arab world in the last few months. The scenes on Tahrir Square in Cairo, for example, will stay in people's mind for years. People in Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, Yemen took the streets and protested about lack of jobs, access to education, repression, corruption, and got rid of their Western-backed dictator. A friend of mine called this the second step of the decolonization process. What is your view on this and also of the Libya situation where sanctions have been voted at the UN and where NATO has talked about a military intervention? Right. Uh, first of all, I, I, I would agree with this uh, term, uh, a second phase of decolonization. I, I really think it is true. It's a uh, second phase of post-colonialism. Uh, uh, is a very uh, accurate, uh, I think, term to describe what we're seeing there. I think it is, it's a very important uh, moment for, for all of us, uh, not only people who live in the Middle East, but also people who engage with the Arab world and think that they understood what was going on there, usually through uh, tools which misrepresented the Arab world and actually... Uh, uh, portrayed it in a very negative way. So I think the first thing to say about what's happening is that uh, there is not only the assertion of self-dignity in the Arab world, there, it's a defining moment from the West uh, and it's uh, rather uh, colonialist uh, attitudes towards the Arab world. Secondly, of course, we are talking about a process at, uh, in motion. We uh, see Libya is, is a very painful reminder that it will not be as easy as it has been in Egypt everywhere, nor is it clear that the Egyptian story is over. But um, I do think it, it brings a lot of hope. It's the first time I remember in my lifetime that there are good news coming from the Arab world. And in, by this very sheer sort of sense of positivity, of positive energy that comes from there, it is a, a moment of no return. It's a moment of no return. Just as an historian, I keep reminding myself that a moment of no return does not mean that immediately you have the kind of better reality that you want to happen. Uh, it means that you have to be alert that there will be a lot of powers and a lot of actors, including Israel, who would make the best they can to make this moment uh, disappear. Uh, so you cannot even be passive about it. You have to be active, each one of us, in their own way to help these revolutions to take place. And like in the case of Palestine, there has to be a clear distribution of labor, what everyone can do for this. But it is, it is a dramatic and fantastic moment, which I think will also, in the long run, uh, affect Palestine in a very, very positive way.
Ilan, what is the more global implication of the Arab world revolutions? And are Israel and the U.S. right to feel threatened? Yes, there are two, two different issues here. Uh, the global implication is that um, whether these are academics or journalists or politicians, the schematic way in which they describe society and divide it into actors or factors that are active and can change reality and those who are recipients and cannot change reality has dismantled, I think, uh, collapsed. So I think the global implication is that you can have as much economic and political and military power as you can. There are processes which you cannot control. Maybe it is because of the internet, maybe it's because of the particularly impulses that push the younger generations around the world, but there, are kind of, there is a kind of a unanimity between British students uh, protesting in London and Paris and those protesting in Tunisia, Algier and, uh, and, and Cairo. And, 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 and that sort of teaches us that the way the world is represented through the eyes of its uh, Western elite uh, has been uh, met at a very serious blow, which is good news. Uh, as for um, the uh, United States and Israel, uh, I, I think the United States is a bit more complex than Israel. So to make it a short answer, not a long one, I would say that those in America, and there were very important people in America, who relied on Israel in order to guide them uh, in the politics of the Middle East and Israel, are panicking. This is a moment of panic. Uh, I've been to Israel many times since the revolutions have started, and Israel is in, in a real panic. Uh, they understand that the usual arsenal of power and diplomacy is useless in the face of what's happening in the Arab world. Uh, and they panic because they feel that if indeed uh, democracy would appear on their footsteps and around them, they could not sell anymore the fable that they are the only democracy in the Middle East, and they will be in fact painted as another Arab dictatorial regime. And that could lead to new American thinking, and a new American thinking in the eyes of many Israelis is uh, tantamount to the end of Israel as we know it. As coordinator of the Russell Tribunal in Palestine, I'm now preparing the next session of the tribunal, which is going to take place in South Africa, and we'll talk about the crime of apartheid in relation to Israel. For many, Israel is a democracy because everyone is able to vote and Arabs or Palestinians are represented in the Knesset. So Israel, is Israel a democracy in your opinion? No, Israel is, is definitely not a democracy. Uh, a, a country that occupies another people for more than 40 years and this allows them the most elementary civic and human rights cannot be a democracy. A country that uh, 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 pursues a, a discriminatory policy against uh, f fifths of its uh, Palestinian citizens inside the pre-67 uh, borders cannot be a democracy. In fact, Israel is uh, what we used to call in political science a heron folk democracy. It's democracy only for the masters. Uh, the fact that you allow people to participate in the formal side of democracy, namely to vote or uh, to be elected, is useless and meaningless if you don't give them any share in the common good or in the common resources of the state or if you discriminate against them despite the fact that you allow them to participate in the elections. On almost every level from official legislation through governmental practices and social uh, and cultural attitudes, Israel uh, is only a democracy for one group, uh, one uh, ethnic group, we, given the, the space that Israel now controls, is not even a, ma a majority group anymore. So I think you will find it very hard to use any known definitions of democracy which would be applicable for the Israeli case. What is your nationality, Ilan? I don't have a clear nationality. I have a citizenship, an Israeli citizenship, Funny enough, I also have a European nationality because uh, as a, a second-generation European Jews, we are entitled to get a European passport. Uh, 
which is not equivalent to nationality, but it obfuscates the question of nationality. I would like to think myself as, uh, as a member of a potential new nation that would emerge in the secular democratic state of Israel, where uh, it would be a combination of a society made of a third generation of the settler colonialists who came to Palestine in the late 19th century and the indigenous native population. Uh, whether at the time that this would happen, people would still define themselves in national terms or not, I don't care, and I don't know. Uh, but uh, I feel that uh, I am part of a settler colonialist community which pretends to be a national community by itself and is recognized as such, like the Australian and the New Zealanders ones. But I think this, if this is the kind of, the only national identity open to me, I reject it and would like to work towards something much better for me and for others. For many people, the Israel-Palestine conflict is about the Holocaust and the fact that the Jews of Europe had to find a place to live where they felt safe. Once the Jews arrived in Palestine, the dispute started about the land between them and the indigenous population, the, pa the Palestinians. The dispute has now been going for more than 60 years, both parties finding it impossible to reach a peace settlement. Is that what the conflict is about, in your opinion? No, no, definitely. The conflict uh, uh, is not about the Holocaust. The Holocaust is manipulated by the Israelis in order to maintain the conflict for their own interests. The conflict is, is a simple story of European settlers coming in the late 19th century motivated by all kinds of ideas. The dominating idea was that they need a safe haven because Europe was not safe and that this was their ancient homeland. It happened before. It was the, it's not the only place where people had these uh, weird ideas that they can come after 2,000 years and reclaim something which was supposedly theirs. Uh, and because uh, there were enough imperial powers willing to support this set colonization project, they succeeded in putting a foothold and starting first purchasing land. Uh, and they uh, exploited a certain land regime by which you could buy land from people who didn't really own it uh, and uh, um, expel the people who really cultivated it. And, uh, it, but even that was not very successful. As, as you probably know, by the time the British mandate ended, uh, the Zionist movement occu uh, succeeded in purchasing less than 7% of Palestine and bringing in uh, a, a number of refugees, including after the Holocaust, which was not very impressive. All in all, uh, uh, the Jewish community in the world preferred to go to Britain, uh, the United States, or stay in Europe despite of the Holocaust very tiny minority came to, to, to Israel. And that's why, contrary to their earlier wishes, the Zionist movement decided to bring Jews from the Arab world and de-Arabize them so that they would become Jewish and not uh, identify with the Arab population. So the conflict is, is about a colonialist movement that because of the Holocaust succeeds in not appearing colonialist in a world that does not like colonialism anymore and is using all kinds of means and alliances to continue to colonize, ethnically cleanse and occupy. It's an incomplete atrocity. Zionism is an incomplete atrocity against the Palestinian people. Had it been complete, as the Australian, the whites did in Australia and New Zealand, you probably would not have had a conflict today. Um, but it's good to understand why it's incomplete. That's because of Palestinian steadfastness and resistance. And uh, there you have, in a nutshell, a colonialist project trying to complete, complete its, its plan, indigenous people resisting it, and that, that would be a conflict unless you decolonize Palestine and you move towards a post-colonialist stage in the history of this place. So last question. You have been a human rights activist for many years now, fighting on all fronts to help the Palestinians, with unfortunately very little results. More land is being stolen every, year, every day, more people die, more houses are destroyed, and the international community reward Israel for this. So what is the way forward for the Palestinians 
and their supporters around the world. I think the first thing to say is that we have to have a more uh, comprehensive historical view of successes and failures. I don't think it's all failure. Uh, the present uh, Palestinian community in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, the present Palestinian community inside Israel would uh, not crack. It's very clear. Whatever the Israeli policies would be, Israel cannot that easily contemplate another ethnic cleansing. And that's very important to understand. Uh, secondly, I think something has changed in public opinion. Granted, it has not been translated into policies but we may are, we may be in the defining moment for Palestine without yet knowing it. So I, I would like to have a more balanced view about failure and success for all of us. I think it's important to understand it's not all failure. However, I, I do agree that we need a clear strategy uh, forward. And I, I think first, there the are three things which I would uh, very shortly and very briefly uh, point. One is that we need a better understanding of the distribution of labor between outside and inside. Namely, uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, political system needs to get its act together in terms of representation, unification, and so on. Uh, and the solidarity movement should not try to replace it in, on questions of representation, but should concentrate on turning Israel into a pariah state, which I think is very important in order to get things moving. So, so one is distribution labor. Secondly, I think we have to change the dictionary. We should stop talking about peace process. We should give up the uh, idea of two-state solution, to my mind. We should talk about colonialism again, anti-colonialism, change of regime, uh, ethnic cleansing, reparation in the, in the larger uh, term, all kinds of uh, non-phrases uh, uh, which are very applicable to the situation in Palestine and because of Israeli propaganda and American support for that propaganda, we didn't dare to use them. We have to, to make sure that even the mainstream media and academia, and definitely the politicians are going to use it. And the third thing uh, we have to do is to accept the analysis the change from within uh, is not likely to happen. And that uh, 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 brings forth the question of what kind of strategy do you adopt if you want to enforce the change from outside. And luckily, we have a very good uh, example that most people are now pushing the nonviolent strategies rather than the violent strategies for change, which is good because I think a new reality that is going to be born out of a nonviolent a, a, a struggle would create a much better relationship uh, at the time of reconciliation, whereas if you will win the liberation, if you want, through violence, we know from other historical cases, you become a violent society yourself. So I think there's a lot to be done, and the good thing about this age of ours is that there's a lot you can do as an individual, but never forget the organizations. Uh, and not the old organization as well, especially in the case of Palestinian representation. Not always you have to invent the wheel. Sometimes you have to oil it and make sure that it works again as well as it did in the past.